always start by thanking you not just for your service but for protecting our way of life from those who would take it away from us and there are many we represent what is it four and a half five percent of the population of the earth and uh, that puts us at a distinct disadvantage so thank you uh, to all of you for your service I wrote uh, two books about my experiences in Vietnam the first one uh, is called one young soldier was published in 2007 and then I've just published a sequel where I attempted to add in the um, the effect of war on the people who wait at home. It's called Angie's War. And it brings the story forward to some of the current wars. So I was with the 1st Cavalry Division, uh, Delta Company 1st Battalion 12th. I'd actually been in the National Guard here in Kansas. We were activated in 68 and uh, sent to Fort Carson, Colorado, so we could train for jungle warfare in the desert, which made a lot of sense. And then they started levying us over as replacements, and I didn't get levied. So um, in one of my stupider moments, I went and volunteered. And I volunteered for the first CAV because my uncle was killed uh, in February of 51 in Korea with the first CAV, so it's been sort of a family tradition. Uh, my father and all the other uncles were in World War II. My grandfather was mustard gassed in Belgium in World War I. We go all the way back, I can trace it back to the Civil War, uh, although we've never had a professional soldier or Marine in the family. We always wind up in the wars, it seems like. So uh, I like to throw a little data at people right off the bat. Uh, because of Agent Orange and PTSD and some other factors, the life expectancy for Vietnam veterans is considerably shorter than it is for most people in our society. World War II veteran had a normal life expectancy of 78 years. Korean War veteran had a life expectancy of 74 years. Vietnam veterans uh, have a life expectancy of 65 years. And in fact, uh, of the 2.7 million men and women who served in Vietnam, there are only about 850,000 of us still alive. Fully 70% uh, plus have already passed away. Vietnam veterans are at a much higher risk than normal people of all that stuff. Many kinds of cancer, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, kidney disease, you can read the list. I have uh, seven of those. So map of South Vietnam from the time of where I served is in that little crosshatched area that we called the fish hook. It's just northwest of uh, Saigon in Tay Ninh province. One of the reasons I volunteered for the CAV other than family history was because theoretically they were the air mobile division. So instead of having to hump heavy packs three and four and five days at a time, we got to fly wherever we were going. I thought, well, that's a smart move. Between the time I volunteered and the time I got there, they changed the modus operandi and decided really didn't need to fly us around that much. So we got to hump the heavy packs like everybody else did. But you also uh, kind of affects your knees and your back and the rest of you years later from jumping out of helicopters with 70, 80 pounds on your back. Most of the time we humped through the jungle. Our job, um, I was in an infantry company. We were long range reconnaissance in force, which had been called search and destroy before that, but they decided that sounded too aggressive to the folks at home. So they changed it to long range reconnaissance in force. But our job was to hump through the jungle single file and try to find the North Vietnamese. So the average temperature in the daytime would be 105, 110. The humidity would be in the high 90% range. We would be off the fire base for 30, 40, 50 days at a time sometimes without a bath, maybe one change of clothes, eating Korean War sea rations and drinking water that got purified from the rivers and streams but still contained parasites and other such stuff. Mosquitoes would carry you away at night if you didn't have some good bug juice. And if you had the good bug juice, it ran in your eyes and burned and smelled bad. Uh, anytime you got near water, which was pretty often, 
you'd get leeches. You'd stop for a break and roll up your pant leg and burn 10 or 12 leeches off each leg with a cigarette. Everybody smoked, although I quit later, um, because it was the only real pleasure you had. I mean, otherwise, you couldn't look forward to the food. You couldn't look forward to the water. You didn't get any sleep. You were on listening post or ambush every night. Uh, the only thing you had to look forward to was the next cigarette and a letter from home. And every so often, these fellas, who were fine soldiers, would pop up and try to kill us. They had a distinct advantage because we were making noise, chopping our way single file through the jungle, and they were typically well concealed in bunkers and spider holes. And so they'd hear us coming, and they would quiet down and hunker down. And so we uh, lost a lot of point people. Uh, we had to go single file because the jungle was so thick. Couldn't have any flank security or anything like that. I walked point for my first three months. Um, and in, like I said, we lost a lot of point people. So here's a little larger map of uh, Tainian province, the Fishhook area. There's only one big city there, and it's not that big, the city of Tainian. There's a mountain there called Nui Ba Din, which means the Black Virgin Mountain. It's a holy site for the Buddhists of uh, Vietnam. And then our fire base was called LZ Grant. Everybody else called them fire bases. Being in the air cab, we called them landing zones because we had to be different, I suppose. So here's a picture of Grant from the air, football shaped, 150 yards long, about 80, 90 yards wide. There were bunkers around the perimeter. That's where we looked forward to going to when we got back out of the field every 30, 40, 50 days. So being the grunts, we got to man the bunkers on the perimeter and, and stand guard every night and still put listening posts out into the jungle. But the fire base had all these artillery pits which supported us when we were out in the, in the bush. Anytime we get in a firefight, the first thing we do is call in artillery. So we appreciated them and they liked that we kept them secure, I suppose. That fire base was attacked three times in 1969. The North Vietnamese uh, decided it was in a bad place. It was actually on the confluence of three of their main trails out of Cambodia toward Saigon. So there were uh, three ground attacks, three major ground attacks in 69. Uh, lost, we lost a, a number of people killed and a lot of people wounded, but we killed hundreds and hundreds of North Vietnamese in Viet Cong. And after each one of the battles, they would bring a bulldozer out and pile up the bodies and dig a hole and push them in. So there was a huge mass grave to the northwest corner of that landing of that fire base. That I understand the uh, North Vietnamese government came down and excavated rather thoroughly after the war to try to re retrieve the remains of, of their missing soldiers. This is what one of the bunkers looked like on the uh, perimeter. There wasn't any real shade there, so it was really hot. The cloud in the distance is not a cloud at all. It's dust and smoke from a B-52 strike, what we called an arc light. One of those guys. Uh, each, one, each aircraft carried 84,000 pounds of bombs. Uh, it took two passes to get rid of them all. They would uh, come by and drop half the bombs, and then they'd make a circle, and exactly five minutes later, to the second, they would drop the other half of the bombs. And it made the uh, jungle look like the surface of the moon. You could go into a spot, have a firefight, pull you out, bring in the B-52, send you back in to see what damage was done, and you wouldn't even recognize it. It was totally different. So we loved the B-52s. And the Cobras. Cobras were great. Cobras uh, could loiter for a while. They had a lot of weaponry, and they could get in real close. A lot of the problem with artillery and airstrikes 
was that they couldn't get close enough. Most of our firefights were from here to that wall over there, and the closest we could get with a, with a phantom strike would be about 200 meters. So unless somebody accidentally got hit by a piece of shrapnel, they didn't do much good. The napalm was pretty effective. I like napalm. Here's an F4 uh, doing a 20 millimeter ground strike. This is my platoon. You will be um, struck by the fact that they look so young. Our average age was about 19. We had one kid who turned 17 in Vietnam. There's me looking uh, clean and uh, clean not long after I got there, and then uh, a couple months later, it, it sort of wore on you a little bit. This fellow, his name is Rod Evans, Rodney J. Evans. He was uh, in my squad. We uh, got into a uh, firefight one afternoon. Our company commander was not a brilliant tactician, and I'm being kind. So uh, he decided to call in a medevac at the site of the firefight. And uh, he didn't even run a patrol around the other side of the bomb crater where we called the medevac in. So the medevac got part way down into the hole in the jungle and the North Vietnamese opened up on it and uh, almost shot it out of the sky. They killed two of the guys on board and wounded both the others. But the medevac made it back. We stopped there for the night we hadn't been resupplied for, I think, five days. So the next morning, we figured what they would do would be pull us back and blow the hell out of the place, and then we'd go in and pick up the pieces. But somebody back in the rear decided it would be a better move if we went in and reconnoitered it a little closer. I had been on listening post between our position and the NBA the night before, and you could hear them in the bunkers talking and laughing and cooking and rattling their pots and pans. And they were having a good old time. They knew we were there. So we'd throw grenades and call in artillery, but it didn't do any good. So we knew they were there. Anyway, uh, Rod walked point that morning, and uh, we didn't get very far, 20, 30 meters, and they started blowing command detonated anti-personnel mines on us, which they had done the day before. Uh, Rod saw one and dived on it. Um, the last, I was two guys back from him. The last I saw of him alive, he had his hand on his belt knife. I think he was trying to get his knife out and cut the wires before they could blow the mine. But just as he got to it, they blew it right in his face. So it took off his nose, the bottom half of his face, a lot of his throat, a lot of damage to his upper chest but it didn't kill him right away. So we had a couple of minutes uh, with the medic and us uh, holding on to Rod, trying to give him a little comfort while he was basically drowning on his own blood. Um, it was the day after his 21st birthday. He was awarded the Medal of Honor two years later. Here's President Nixon giving it to his mother and father and sister and brother. He had a twin brother. So last July 18th of, six, of 2019, I had the honor of going to his hometown in Florala, Alabama and uh, giving one of these talks only specifically focused on that morning and what had happened exactly because they're, they'd never really been told the, the exact story another fellow from the squad and I went down for that. It was an honor to be there. Uh, you've seen that picture before, haven't you? Yeah. So peculiar thing about my battalion and specifically my company, that's the cover of the um, First Cavalry Division Association calendar for 2020 and on it they've put a picture of every Medal of Honor recipient since the division was formed in 1923. And the four with the red circles around them are all out of my battalion. And three of them are out of my company from December of 67 to January of 70.
The one in the, the guy on the bottom is John Baca, who is a real good friend of mine now. Uh, in February of 70, he was in a night firefight. He threw a grenade into the position where he was fighting from. He was a 90 millimeter recoilless rifle gunner. It landed between him and his assistant gunner. And he took his helmet off, put it on the grenade, and rolled on it. And he told me this story one day. We were at a wedding up in Maryland. And uh, we had some time just to be out and talk. He said after he rolled on the grenade, it seemed like a long time went by and it didn't go off. So he thought maybe it was a dud or they threw it without pulling the pin. And he was just about to lift the helmet off and pick it up and try to throw it when it did go off. I've seen him without his shirt. You wouldn't believe he's still alive, the damage to his body. But he's lived a uh, physically at least a pretty normal life. He, Spends all of his time taking care of other Medal of Honor recipients from the San Diego, LA area in California. And he's just a really good man. Nobody can explain why we have all these Medal of Honor people from that one company, which is a very small part of the division over that length of time. I'm pretty sure nobody was setting out to get a Medal of Honor. It's just a coincidence. but. We were in a lot of contact then, so maybe that was it. Here's John more recently. Um, the guy between Rod Evans and me is Mitchell Hamabata. Mitchell is from uh, Kauai, Hawaii. Um, he was the first one to get to Rod and, and was there up close and personal um, while he was dying. Uh, Mitchell made it through his tour, went back home, and a couple of months later he had started back to college, and he was living with his mom and his sister, and he came home one day, and something had set him off. Somebody had said something, I don't know, but he sat down on the couch and he started to cry, and his sister went over and put her arm around him and, and said, you know, what's wrong, what's going on? And he, he just poured out the story of Rod and another guy he was close to who died in a pretty awful way. And then he just uh, became unresponsive. He checked out. He wouldn't talk to anybody. He wouldn't get up. He wouldn't move. They put him in a VA hospital for about a year, but that didn't seem to help much. They took him out, put him in a private hospital. Mitchell spent the rest of his life in uh, mental institutions of one sort or another or facilities for challenged adult males never went back out in the world. He died in 2004 of Agent Orange related heart disease uh, at the age of, I think, 56. So his name is not on the wall in Washington, D.C., but it's one of the thousands and thousands and thousands of names of veterans who have died from the effects of that war that I think ought to be on that wall. This guy's name is John Wild. Here he is in a normal situation, but every time we'd get into a fire base, which wasn't often, he would find a guitar and he would always be our entertainment. He was a good singer, good guitar player. Well, he and I were really close, but he got hurt, pulled out of the field, and then I got hurt and pulled out of the field as he was going back, and then I came home not long after. So I lost track of him. I knew he was from Southern California, but I didn't know where. So I used to drive the 411 operators crazy, trying to say, is there a Jonathan Wild down there? Yeah, but do you have any idea how many area codes we have in Southern California? So that was before the internet, right? So um, I was out in, uh, in uh, Solvang, California on business from Santa Barbara and uh, turned out he was the entertainment at this uh, festival that I went to. So we had a great reunion and uh, he invited me to his place and we got to be really good friends again. I was made honorary grandpa, uncle, dad, 
That's his family, really, really close family. We were seeing each other two, three times a year. He'd come back here, I'd go out there. And then a couple of years later, uh, he came down with throat cancer, which uh, took, a, took the VA about a year to diagnose, or to agree that it was from Agent Orange, but they did. Uh, he lived for four years with a feeding tube and doing chemo and radiation uh, before he finally uh, just couldn't take it anymore. And he died in 2011. So there's another name that ought to be on the wall in Washington, D.C. Uh, 2.7 million Americans served, quote unquote, on the ground in Vietnam. More than 58,000 were killed, 304,000 were wounded, of whom 75,000 were severely disabled, and about 40,000 were totally disabled. Uh, 2,600 went missing. We've since recovered about 1,000 bodies, but there are still about 15, 1,600 uh, that we haven't found. And in total, over the uh, 15 plus years that we fought there, Nearly 3 million Vietnamese, Laotians, and Cambodians were killed. Can you imagine? Three, 3 million people in that tiny area. And the effects of the Agent Orange and some of the other things that we did while we were there are still uh, quite obvious. My brother-in-law is a lawyer, but he's good friends with a surgeon, and he went over last summer to help this surgeon uh, in the operating room to do surgeries on... Uh, children who had uh, facial deformities. And while he was there, he noted that there were just scores of kids coming in that were still being born with birth defects from the Agent Orange that's still there in the earth and in the jungles uh, 50 years later. After 10 years of official fighting, we walked away abandoning our allies to the North Vietnamese we actually had that war won twice. We had it won after Tet 68, if we'd have pressed the advantage that we took then and gone north, I think we could have brought it to an end. A lot of people believe that. And we had it won again in about 19, the end of 1970 uh, with the bombing that was done in the north. Uh, we could have pressed the advantage, but we didn't have the uh, political courage to take it forward. And so we wound up walking away and abandoning the people who had been loyal to us all those years. And then 20 years later, we normalized diplomatic trade and tourism relations with unified communist Vietnam, and we're now close friends. I had a company commander who was leaving the field. The officers only stayed out for six months, whereas the enlisted guys got to stay out for a year. I never thought that was quite fair. He was leaving to go take a rear job, and he got all the uh, platoon leaders and squad leaders and platoon sergeants together, and he said, you know, President Nixon's already said the war's over. All we're doing now is holding in place until the South Vietnamese can take over their own defense. And he said, maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't, but at some point, they're already starting to withdraw people from the war. So, quote, don't be the last poor dumb son of a bitch to get killed in Vietnam, and don't let your men be the last poor dumb sons of bitches to get killed in Vietnam. Because 20 years from now, he said 20 years ago, the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese were the most heinous mothers on the planet, and now we're good friends with them. And he said 20 years from now, We'll be really good friends with Vietnam, but if you're dead, you're still going to be dead. And he, he nailed it. 20 years was the number, and 20 years was the number. So as I pointed out earlier, uh, now well ahead of our time, 70% of us who served there are gone. So I already told you the story about having to sit down and have a heart to heart with my wife. This is my last platoon leader, a fellow named John Dodson, West Point, class of 68. You know, Airborne Ranger, all that. Uh, when I heard he was going to take over our platoon, 
the day Rod was killed, I went from being a point man to being the platoon leader because we were so short on NCOs and I was a sergeant. A couple of days later, this guy came in and I heard he was a West Point guy and I thought, okay, we're in for it now. They had a reputation for being somewhat gung-ho and taking unnecessary risks. Well, he was absolutely the finest officer I ever served with. He, he got right to it and said, you know, we're not trying to win this thing, so why don't we just try to keep ourselves alive and as unhurt as possible and make our way back home again? which of course got a lot of loyalty from the men in the platoon, right? So uh, he and I stayed really good friends. I was honored to be at his uh, retirement from the Pentagon in uh, 1997. He had been in for 33 years. He was working for the chief of staff of the Army at the time, uh, overseeing all the National Guard programs around the country. Since his retirement, he's done some consulting and things, but what he does mostly these days is he works with the um, Walter Reed Hospital in Bethesda. He's a case manager for the Wounded Warrior Mentoring Project, so he'll handle somewhere between 10 and 30 cases of severely wounded people. So when I go visit him up there, sometimes I go to Bethesda with him and Anybody can visit the hospital in Bethesda. So I go into some of the rooms and I meet with some of these people who are coming back from the wars today. And so I've gained a lot of experience with some of the current day wounds. My body armor when I was in Vietnam was a t-shirt. Um, and it was a well-worn t-shirt. I'd been wearing it every day for a couple months. So it was pretty thin. So if you had a BB gun, it would shoot through my body armor, right? So we were essentially unprotected. Today, the body armor is, by comparison, excellent. Kevlar covers the vital organs, the shoulders, tops of the hips, the groin area. Excellent Kevlar helmet, which on the surface is a good thing, but what's happening is the enemy, and we have many, have learned that the way to hurt people wearing this kind of body armor is not to shoot them in the chest, but to blow up an IED to explode a mine under their vehicle to ambush them with a big blast of an artillery shell or a bomb. And so people are coming back with these horrendous, horrendous wounds. I've met folks who had no arms and no legs fellow on the right there lost both his hands. He was burned over 85% of his body. He's lost a lot of his vision, although he can still see. So when you go to that hospital and you visit these people and you see how, I mean, they're as good as we have, right? These people are, a lot of them are professional soldiers. They've given their whole life to defending the country and these these horrible wounds happen. And, and they're being saved by excellent medical facilities and, and the great body armor, but they're facing a very difficult life ahead of them uh, trying to deal with these issues. And now that women are um, authorized to occupy any combat position in any branch of the service, and even well before that, we're seeing a lot of women take these serious, serious injuries, um, which shouldn't make a difference to us I guess, but somehow it breaks my heart a little bit more when I see a woman being injured that way. A lot of people don't know it, but right now around the world, American service members are drawing either hazardous duty pay or combat pay in all those countries, basically all of Southwest Asia almost all of Africa, almost all the Middle East and some parts of Southeast Europe. Oh, that's not the only slide, here's another one. Because their lives are at, at risk by just doing their job every day if they're stationed in one of those places, which means that they're being 
stressed, combat stress. Anytime you walk out in the morning not knowing if you're going to get blown up by an IED or whatever, it puts stress on you. So according to the VA and some other sources, and I've seen higher numbers than this, as many as 60% of the veterans from these current wars are suffering from serious long-term mental and emotional issues. A Harvard professor, a woman, did a study recently and projected that since an awful lot of wounded or injured or damaged veterans don't file for benefits until they get older and it starts to really move in on them, she's estimated that the cost of taking care of the veterans of today's wars might be as much as $4 trillion over the next 40 or 50 years. That doesn't happen to be in a budget anywhere right now. Suicide rate among veterans is more than twice the national average. This number has been fluctuating from 19 up to, I've seen it as high as 23 over the last few years, but the last I heard, 22 veterans are taking their own lives every day in America. But in 2018, the VA spent less than one-tenth of one percent of its suicide prevention budget of $62 million. So Congress is looking into that, but that's a big issue too. I usually give these talks to people who aren't veterans because my whole point is to help people understand the cost of war and the cost, the human cost of defending our country against all the threats that exist in the world. And uh, you being a mostly veteran group or a largely veteran group, you probably knew a lot of what I've been saying to you. But what I do, uh, one young soldier is basically a, 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 a novel that is based on my experiences in Vietnam and shortly after. Um, Angie's War I just finished. I tried to bring it forward. It includes a lot about what's going on in Afghanistan and Iraq and Somalia and Syria and you name it and what's happening with a lot of the people coming back with these serious injuries and also tries to hold the perspective of the people who wait at home while their loved ones are away. You know, in Vietnam, I didn't get to make a phone call home the whole time I was there. These days, people in combat areas have access to the internet, satellite phones, so it's a little easier to communicate. But that's both a good and a bad thing. I've heard of a couple of incidents where somebody was severely wounded and knew they were dying and got whipped out their satellite phone and called home to talk to their wife one last time while they were bleeding to death. So I'm not sure that's a good thing. Anyway. I'm trying to help people understand that we have a cost here. We need to be thoughtful before we engage. And we need to know that there's an end to it before we engage, I believe. Not necessarily a victory in the terms of the wars that used to be, but at least we know we have a mission that we can complete. We've been in Afghanistan now for 19 years. Can you explain why you called it Angie's War, what the reason behind that? The, uh, the character who goes start to finish is a woman named Angie who is the wife of a, of a uh, point man in Vietnam. And uh, I won't give the story away, but early in the book, Angie writes a letter to her husband, who she loves dearly, that um, causes him to lose his focus on what he's doing and uh, because of that, he momentarily slips up and uh, is, is severely wounded. Um, and I tried to write a lot of the book from Angie's perspective as she survived the war and, and what happens there and goes on, tries to go on with her life, ultimately has a son who decides to go to West Point and winds up in Afghanistan and so forth. So she's, I wanted to, I wanted to put the woman's, the, the, not the, necessarily a woman, but the, the, uh, the spouse's perspective into one of these books. Okay. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight.